Okay, so our goal for this video is to take a look at the properties of carbon that make it important. Carbon's all often termed the foundation of life or the backbone of life. And carbon atoms form diverse molecules by bonding to other atoms. Now what's special about carbon, of course, is it's it's got this ability to form four covalent bonds. And we'll take a look at why in a second. But that allows it to form the sort of, according to the octet rule, the maximum number of connections you can make according to those old sort of archaic Lewis diagrams, but still work for carbon because of its special structure and it's so early on in the periodic table. Now, we'll cover in the next slide why carbon can do this and what's so special about it and why its bonds are pretty much always covalent and why four other atoms, uh, that makes it pretty much the maximum of the available atoms to form bonds, but basically carbon is going to sort of form three types of general structures. You'll in organic chemistry and biochemistry, carbon's always sort of the bones of the skeleton of the molecules we're going to have. So we see straight chains where all the carbons are linked together. Carbon often bonds to itself. Branch chains, okay? and then we'll also see these ring type structures. And we'll see these structures over and over again. In fact, many times when we draw these, we won't even end up drawing um, the actual structures in terms of the carbons and so on and so forth, we might draw a straight chain, for example, just something like this, and then put the hydrogens on the end. I'm not going to draw them in here, I'm just going to draw dots. Um, in fact, in organic chemistry, sometimes we don't even draw the hydrogens because they're so common. The thing that makes a carbon atom so special and so fundamental to life is its structure. And just a quick review of its structure, we've got its nucleus with six protons and six, and six neutrons. We've got its six electrons and the two, four type relationship. So if we drew a Lewis diagram, we would end up with carbon having its four valence electrons. So it makes it sort of, according to the old Lewis diagrams, have the maximum number of bonds that something can really deal with. And if we were to draw the Lewis structure for carbon, we're going to see that it's going to have four valence electrons. And its electronegativity value is going to be, and there's different ways of measuring electronegativity and different levels of accuracy, but it's going to be around 2.55. Okay. And this means that this carbon molecule is pretty much in the middle of the road because electronegativity typically runs around from zero up to a maximum of around four. It's not an absolute scale, there's some differences in there in how you measure it, but that's the basics of carbon in terms of its electronegativity. It's sort of middle of the road, so no matter what you combine carbon with, oftentimes you're always going to get this covalent bond where we've got the sharing. Now, because of the way these carbon atoms have their electrons arranged in their orbitals, with these four valence electrons, carbon can end up bonding to itself, as we see here, and it can bond to itself with a single bond, a double bond, where, two, where it bonds to itself twice and shares two electrons, or even a triple bond. And it can do this with other atoms too. And in biological systems, we're typically going to see carbon attaching itself with things like hydrogen, of course, oxygen, and nitrogen, as well as phosphorus and sulfur. But carbon is sort of the skeleton, the, the bones of everything we're going to do with organic type chemistry. And what we're going to do when we build these molecules is we're going to build teeny tiny subunits, kind of like trinkets for a friendship bracelet or something like that, and we're going to call those things monomers. So on this diagram, there's a monomer there, just one of these hexagons. What this hexagon represents could be anything. And then when we add these things together, like sort of a, a beaded necklace or, a, again, a friendship bracelet with trinkets, we've got the polymer concept. And these two words, monomer and polymer, are big words. We're going to end up using these over and over again as we go through the class. And it's going to something that's going to come up at the very end of the class as well as right now at the very beginning of the class. Now in terms of the basics and the sort of the, again, the bones 
of organic chemistry and, and biochemistry is, is are the hydrocarbons. So it's carbon connected to itself, that's the bones, and then the hydrogens on top of it. Now, all these hydrocarbons, because of the bonds that go on, they're polar they're nonpolar covalent bonds, all these things are what we would term nonpolar. Okay, so all hydrocarbons by and large, just by themselves, tend to be nonpolar. So you don't, these things are not divisible in water if you see them all by themselves. They, they'll they be like the other fats and the oils, depending on their density, usually you'll find them floating. But if, a, if all the carbons inside a hydrocarbon are all single bonds, what we end up doing is we call those the alkane family. And the alkane family, will anything will always end in ane. The beginning part we use the the prefixes for number so you know you don't you wouldn't have a monine but or or biene but you would have a trying you know three four five six penta hexa heptane octane that you would see in gasoline if you've got at least one double bond like we see right here okay, these would be the alkenes and the number of carbons in it would be the prefix and then you would have the ending in that would tell you that you've got at least one double bond here. Now, where the double bond is located is something you talk about in organic chemistry in your classes there. And but usually we tag a number at the front to talk about which carbon is it is showing the double bond. The alkynes we would use the ending yNES. They have at least one triple bond. And then we have the aromatics, which are always going to be in ring structure. So we've got these compounds, and what we tend to see is we name them according to these basic rules. Now our last little thing we're throwing in here with carbon, and it's the carbon families, the alkanes, alkenes, alkynes, and so on, is the concept of isomers. And isomers are molecules that have the same molecular formula, so they have the same recipe, so they have the same number of carbons, hydrogens, oxygens, and so on and so forth, but you've arranged them differently in space. So it's kind of like a recipe where you get the same ingredients and you get the right amounts of the ingredients, but you mix them together in a different order. And I think if you realize that and you're making cookies, you have to mix those ingredients in a certain order to get the cookies. If you mix them differently, you're going to get something completely different. And this is just another example of and we're going to talk about almost every lesson, form follows function. It's never going to go away for us, ever, ever, ever. It's a constant theme throughout the class. So just a couple examples of isomers here we'll bring in. So if we use the example of butane, we would have four carbons. Because but, the butyl groups have four, and we can arrange them this way. And of course, we're not. I'm not going to draw the hydrogens in just to save some time, some effort here. That's one version of butane. Okay. Now we can take that version of butane. I'm just going to shrink it here so we can draw some more, and we can connect them in a different way. So we can take butane and connect it. So we've got, for example, one carbon here, leading to another carbon, like that like that. And if you were to spend the time and count up the number of hydrogens in both molecules, you can obviously see there's four carbons, but here we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten hydrogens. Here we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So these things have different structures now, but they've got different arrangements in space and if we were to take instead of butane if we were instead to take a look at another molecule that we would call butene where we've got a double bond we could add in another type of isomer where we end up with this double bond in the center and we could have our hydrogens arranged like so and because these hydrogens are crossed from each other we're going to call this a trans type isomer. Okay. And you might have heard of the trans type isomers before and when we get into lipples we talk about a lot more but those are the the trans fats so to speak. Okay. And the other type of isomer that would go with that with the butene isomer would be the cis isomer. 
So we'd have the same structure, roughly. Chemical carbons in the same place, but this time we're going to put those hydrogens on the same side. And this is going to be the cis isomer because those two carbon those two hydrogens on either side of the double bond are in the same spot. Now, again, there's lots and lots of different types of isomers, but there is one sort of weird one need to be aware of, and we'll deal with that in class. It's a special one. It's a special type of isomer that is sort of a, a mirror image. So if you can think of your hand, we can call them enanti enantiomers or chiral molecules. The pop property ends up being called chirality. This just gives you a visualization of two different types of optical isomers. Usually on most of them you've got a carbon atom in the center, uh, although it can be very, very complicated, like these two amino acids. Uh, they're both alanine, but because if you look at them, they're mirror images, there's a line of symmetry where you can take this molecule and flop it over, like flipping a door on a hinge, and get the other molecule. They're different things in space. Again, it's a lot like your right and your left hand. They look pretty much the same, but if you try and superimpose them and get things in the right spot, it doesn't work. So these are special isomers, and again, form follows function. So if you're looking for you know, the right-handed, the D-alanine isomer, and you get the left one, um, it, it's going to do some of the same things, but not be able to do everything else. So we'll look at some, uh, some examples, some dramatic examples of that in class.